Well, on Sunday mornings like this, we usually kick off the program with the Go Wild series, which chronicles efforts at preserving and protecting endangered flora and fauna in Nigeria and beyond. Afro-Montane forests, which are forests that exist across African highlands, store some of the world's most unique biodiversity. Unfortunately, these ecosystems are highly endangered, and here in Nigeria, very few Afro-Montane forests survive. But in Taraba State, an organization has spent the past two decades restoring these forests that once existed all across the Mambila Plateau. Arise environmental correspondent Leila Johnson Salami spent some time on the Plateau reporting on these habitats and the efforts to protect them. Situated on the Mambila Plateau in Taraba State, Nigeria, the Ngalnyaki Forest Reserve is home to some of the richest and rarest biodiversity in the world. The site is managed by the Nigerian Montane Forest Project, an organization founded in 2004 by Professor Hazel Chapman, an evolutionary ecology and conservation professor at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. But Professor Chapman's life in Nigeria started much earlier in the 1970s. Growing up on the plateau was very interesting. My father uh, was based on the Mambilla Plateau because he was a forest officer employed by the Nigerian Forest Service and his job was to survey the native forests of the south of the then northeast state which was subsequently Gongola and now Taraba and Adamawa states. I returned to Nigeria in 2002 when I first started working at Ngalnyaki, almost nothing was known about the ecology of West African montane forests. And so we've done a lot of work into trying to re-establish Afro-montane forest ecosystem and grow Ngalnyaki forest back into the reserve from where it's been removed already. Professor Hazel Chapman came to our university and uh, requested for uh, staff who were interested in biodiversity and conservation and I was among the staff that were selected. I personally develop great interest in what's going on here. So based on that interest, uh, Professor Hazel Chapman facilitated my PhD research at the University of Canterbury. Afro-montane forests are rich, humid ecosystems that exist in mountainous regions across the continent. These important habitats are unfortunately highly endangered on the Mambilla Plateau, and this is primarily due to widespread burning and grazing for cattle and other agricultural practices. So working with driven members of the community like Misa helps with engaging surrounding villages on the need to safeguard the forest. I met Misa way back in 2002. We arrived at this village called Yelwa and were looking at guides to take us into the forest. Misa was one of the first uh, people to approach me. I was very keen to work on this forest. This is a very unique project. The home of carbon, the home of primates, the home of reptiles, the home of birds. For the better part of two decades, Dr. Chapman and her team have gathered a wide range of data on these forests and their biodiversity, from species diversity to forest regeneration to data on seed dispersal. This project is greatly contributing to humanity's understanding of Afro-Montane forests. So we have a lot of trees that have been cut in before, but due to the conservation, awareness to people. Many people now stream down the cutting of the trees as a result of the enlightenment they have in respect of uh, conservation. You know, formally we don't know cutting of trees have, is having effect. Yeah. Through education, forest conservation and restoration, the project seems to be gaining popularity with members of surrounding communities which gives Ngalnyaki Forest Reserve a greater opportunity to thrive. Several significant studies have taken place here over the years, and so far, 
The Nigerian Montane Forest Project has published 69 peer-reviewed science publications. I think the project itself is actually the biggest contribution to science. Of course, you have other things like there's a lightning project with the University of Exeter. Tim Hill from Exeter and his research group carried out simulations through simulations into the future. They found that by 2100, between 20 to 60 percent of trees in tropical forests may be killed by lightning strikes. Field assistants from our project have worked with Tim to put literally hundreds of coils around large trees in the forest. If the lightning strikes this tree, then you can, you can know if by the fuse getting burnt. And so they have fitted about more than 2,000 of these coils in um, trees in the plot and trees even outside the, the plot. You know, the scientists that are engaged on these projects, predominantly local scientists, some trained elsewhere, but mostly trained here in Nigeria, um, the w work that they do contributing um, to the global conversation about climate change is immensely important because most of this world's natural resources and forests are still largely in places like Africa. My name is Iviaren Abiem. I'm a lecturer at the University of Jos and I got involved with the project in 2013. So I currently manage the forest geo plot here at Ingelnyaki. The Smithsonian Forest Global Earth Observatory Plot is a key partnership project here in Ngalnyaki. Forest Geo is a worldwide network of forest research sites and scientists who study the diversity of these ecosystems. When I got involved setting up the plot and understanding what it involves and how it's meant to be a long-term project, um, I really wanted to be in it for a very long time. And through our discussion and understanding what this amount of data you collect from such a large plot um, could do in science, um, I decided to do a PhD um, looking at what structures this forest by using data from the plot. While several wildlife animals are reported to be locally extinct on the Mambilla Plateau, Elisha, the project science coordinator, has spent time carrying out field surveys on the wildlife that you can find here. There are five uh, primates here, like the chimps. We have the Portinus monkey, the Tantalus monkey, the Mona monkey, as well as uh, the baboons. Uh, for some of the ungulates, like the bush bog, the um, uh, red flank dica, uh, the blue dica, I came across the uh, jackal. So, which add up to some of our lists. I remember myself from Ngalnyaki in the 1970s, there used to be a lot of colobus monkey all around the forest edge. They are extinct now. I know that there were lion, there were buffalo, there were elephants, there were large populations of chimpanzee as, as recently as the 1950s and these have all gone or almost all gone. Disputes over land resources between farmers and herdsmen across the middle belt of Nigeria does mean that this region is vulnerable to conflict. While the field station is reported to be safe for a majority of the time, the team here still have to be vigilant as the situation is fragile. In 2017, we had our own bit of experience because this field station was almost put ablaze but because of the love the community has for this project, there was an immediate uh, support to coil down the problem. If somebody came from nowhere to speak to him, to speak to the villagers that they should stop burning or slashing, they won't understand. So I have to come with a strategy to tell them the importance of the species that we have. So we are having a series of meetings, joining their head together, informing them about the importance of peace in our communities. All of them underst understood and now they are all living peacefully without any problem again. Since 2004, just under 20,000 trees have been planted in the Ngelnyaki Forest Reserve. Regardless of the fact that about 1.6 billion people depend directly on forests for food, 
energy, shelter, medicines and income. The world is losing about 10 million hectares of forest each year. To put that in context, that's about the size of Iceland. I first visited Taraba State in the 1970s and I remember driving from Bali to Surti, which is at the bottom of the plateau and actually all the way up to the top of the plateau and that drive, which is about three hours, was through thick woodland. From 2015 onwards there's been huge deforestation thanks to the rapacious appetite from wood from offshore buyers. Uh, the place has turned into a semi-desert. The Nigerian Montane Forest Project funds income generating activities for the local communities. And an exciting development in the community is investment in honey production. Translated to English, Ngalnyaki actually means a place of bees. We had a three day training, and over 100 participants were here on the first day. And on the second day, of course, we had more. And for those who were here, of course, uh, we have about uh, 20 now, if not more, who are actually practicing and have become self-dependent uh, on beekeeping. I hope that there is a long-term future for these forests and for the biodiversity that is within them and that these forests will be there for a very, very long time for their own sake, but very much so for the sake of the local communities that depend on them. Many people are coming for research in this forest and many people are benefiting from the research they are administering here. So as a result of that, it's very important even to us, the community. The Ngalnyaki Forest Reserve is one of the only forests of its type left in Nigeria. By combining education and empowerment with scientific research, the Nigerian Montane Forest Project is greatly contributing to humanity's understanding of tropical ecosystems, which is necessary as our world evolves. On this 4,600 hectare plot, 720 hectares are currently a tropical rainforest. The hope is to restore the entire plot with high-quality Afro-Montane forest, reviving the Mambilla Plateau into the healthy ecosystem that it once was. Leila Johnson Salami, Arise News. Environmental correspondent Leila Johnson Salami joins us now to have a chat about that fantastic report. Congratulations, Leila. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are morning, you doing? Leila. Lovely to see you. It's been so long. Good yes, morning, yes, yes, yes. Welcome back. Happy belated birthday. Oh, I hope you had a good day. It was just yesterday. yesterday. Uh -huh. keep, keep, I swear, keep, keep, keep the vibe going. going. <laughs> <laughs> we'll sing for you oh, before we leave the set today. Absolutely. Yeah? I'm just <laughs> waiting for that award for you, Leila. These Another art. Another no, one. no, no, the, like, the, like the Oscar, the real, the, the, the main, the main award. This is amazing, the work that you're doing and bringing this type of information to the front burner. Congratulations, Leila. Thank well you. Well done. Thank you, thank you. Well, if we start with the, uh, the reforestation pictures we saw, we did see those little pots of new trees being planted. I mean, it's definitely a good thing, but like in your experience, when you look at the time it takes for a tree to grow compared to the deforestation rates, I mean, when you look at that relationship, how much help is it really doing? So that's, that's the huge complex, right? Because for a tree to reach its full maturity takes a while. So it's no good cutting down all the trees and saying, well, we're just going to replant them because it's, it's going to take a while for them to be able to absorb as much carbon as they need to in those ecosystems. But that being said, in the fight against climate change, if we really want to cool global temperatures, there's almost nothing that's more important than the restoration of our biodiversity and ecosystems. I mean, forests are the greatest carbon sinks that we have, and also healthy soil, which is like the unsung hero in the fight against climate change. 
And without these ecosystems, quite frankly, the carbon stays up in the atmosphere. So no matter what, we have to try and find a way to rebuild. And, you know, as Professor Chapman said, when she grew up on the Mambilla Plateau back in the 1970s, that entire area was thick woodland. You go there today, and like she said, it's a semi-desert. Um, I was shocked at what I saw in Taraba State. And we have to be able to build back those ecosystems for our sake for the sake of surrounding communities, and if we really want to push and contribute to the global fight against climate change and cooling global temperatures. All right, Lila, but I mean, isn't Gel Yaki a representative of uh, what other parts of Nigeria is experiencing? Uh, I'm asking this because I know that we've got huge forest reserves uh, in Borno and Niger states, which are the you know biggest states in, in terms of landmass. Unfortunately, they're just there because because of bandits and terrorists, you can't even get anything done. Yeah. You can't even safeguard them. So is Ngel Yaki like what we are now witnessing? And, and secondly, are we planting enough trees now? So, you know, we're getting, we're going to move on to a second report after the break and stuff, which is going to give you a more rounded view on Afro-Montane forest ecosystems. But... In Taraba State, Nigeria's largest national park is situated yeah. there. That's Gashaka Gumti National Park. But what is unique about projects um, like the Ngelnyaki Forest Reserve is that it's one of the only Afro-Montane forest ecosystems that we have left in Nigeria. Now, Afro-Montane forest ecosystems are forests that exist at heights typically 1,300 meters or so and above. Um, so very high up in the clouds. And this is right up on the Mambilla Plateau. We only have surviving populations of Afro-Montane forests there, a tiny bit in Gashaka Gumti as well, which has the bulk of what we have in Nigeria of Afro-Montane forests and also in Obudu. Now, if we only have three regions of the, co of the country left with this particular type of forest, then it shows just how endangered these forests are. Now, I think you said one of the biggest risks is the burning of the forest. So what is the reason for that, usually, when these uh, you know, herders or whoever they are start to burn the bushes the way that they do? So there are multiple reasons. Um, a lot of the time, conflict, disputes over land resources, cattle grazing and rearing, clearing of land for agricultural practices, and um, the cutting down of trees as well, simply for income um, that's not sustainable. So there are a number of reasons, and all of this put together leads to what we're seeing. And then they have also the herders uh, crisis right there in that forest. You know, what was quite instructive uh, was what the lady said there when, you know, growing up, she could find a ton of animals there. She was list them, listing them out now. Now, during your research, did you find out what we have surviving there at this point? So we played it in the report. I'm not sure if you missed that <laughs> part, but um, we went through the animals that still exist in that ecosystem. So you have some monkeys and you have some dikers, for example, but there's not much left. No more lions? No more elephants. That is such a shame. I mean, still, I mean, not to harp on <laughs> the fact that there aren't as many animals there, which is a shame. And one thing that is there seem seemingly is bees and the fact that they're able to produce honey, which I'd imagine is a fantastic thing for the local economy. Tell us more about that. See, for me, that was the most exciting part. Um, because you can see that there's investment in activities that can help to boost some sort of revenue in areas that literally have nothing. And beyond just honey, there's so many products that can be created, beeswax, which you get more money from than you do from honey. And the fact that they're able to train members of the local community and give some people an alternative to going and hunting for bushmeat in these forests when there's hardly anything left to hunt, it's such an important thing to do, you know? All righty. Well, I think we're going to...